This episode goes out to Archibald in Carterton. Hi there, Garrett Robinson here. Welcome to the 12th episode of the Nightblade Epic Podcast Season 2. Today's chapter is a long one, so I want to keep the intro short. I'm just going to rapid-fire some bullet points at you. You ready? Here we go. 1. You should go pre-order A Cloak of Red. It's the newest novel of Underrealm. It comes out on April 10th, and it's basically the best thing ever. Pre-order your ebook, paperback, or hardcover today at underrealm.net slash ttk. 2. The Shadeborn audiobook is out. This is the fourth book in the Nightblade epic, and it's where the story becomes much bigger than Lauren or you could ever have imagined. You can get the Shadeborn audiobook on most audiobook websites, excluding Audible for now, so go pick up your copy. Number three, hey, remember our Discord server? I sure do. Discord is a really cool chat room program that lets you hang out with other nerds who love what you love, and in this case, that means the podcast. If you want to be able to chat with me and a bunch of other nerds, visit underrealm.net slash discord. Whew, that's everything. I sincerely hope you enjoyed today's rapid-fire announcements. Okay, now it's time for today's episode. Today you're getting Chapter 16 of Mystic. When we left off, Zane had just defeated the Mystic Wizard, letting Lauren and her friends escape west along the Dragon's Tail River. Enjoy! Mystic Chapter 16 they saw no other ships behind them after they left Vivian's ship stranded upon the riverbank, nor did they see any ship ahead for the next two days. It made for eerily quiet sailing, and all the more unsettling for the violence that had preceded it. They were still without food, and no effort of Lauren's could produce any fish from the river's flowing waters. Late in the afternoon, the day of the battle, Zane managed to snatch one from the water with his magic, but the effort left him so weak he could hardly stand. Under Brimlad's strict orders, he retired below decks and remained there all that day and the next. Just after dawn, on the second day following the wizard's duel, they at last drew near to Wellmont. Lauren woke with the sun, too famished to go back to sleep. Hunger and fatigue had worked her hard. When she cupped water in her hands and looked upon her reflection, she was shocked at the hollows in her cheeks. She had just begun to prepare herself for another day spent lying on the deck, trying not to move or think any thought about food, when she heard Brimlad's gruff voice. What under the sky? Something in his tone pulled Lauren's attention from her growling stomach, and she wandered listlessly to his side. The captain looked to the horizon ahead. As she followed his gaze, she saw a black cloud sitting low in the sky. Long tendrils stretched down from it, like fingers sinking into the land. A storm? Lauren could do little more than mumble. I would wager not, said Brimlad. Not the right season, and it moves up. What, then? Smoke, said Brimlad from many fires, or one of great size. Lauren remembered the mercenary army she had seen with Jordel, and fear clutched her heart. Jem and Annis rose shortly. Zane remained below. He hardly roused from slumber now. Together they all stood upon the deck, watching the clouds slowly swallow the sky. Mayup it is only from the city's fires, said Jem. Surely they must have smiths and chimneys. I have sailed this river most of my life, boy, said Brimlad. For Wellmont to make that much smoke, you would have to set the whole city ablaze. And look, it is too far south. Lauren could not see more than a few leagues upriver, but it seemed the captain spoke true. They were heading quite a ways north of where the smoke cloud sat upon the horizon. That, at least, hardened her. The city was not burning. But her heart sank again when they drew at last within sight of Wellmont's great river gate and saw the army that waited upon the city's doorstep. Lauren had thought the mercenaries a mighty force. 
They were many hundreds strong, more people than she had ever seen in one place, more than on any street in Cabras. But the army that now stretched before her dwarfed the force of sellswords. Men and horses were clustered so tightly that they ceased to appear as individuals. Instead, they moved like swarms of insects across the land. They stood well beyond the range of bowshot from the city walls, waiting for something. But they were not idle. Up and down the lines, soldiers strode left and right, the army arranging itself as it prepared to march forth into battle. A siege, said Brimlad, though it hardly needed saying. Who are they? said Jem, his voice quivering. Dorsians, said Annis. See, they wear red and yellow. Loren saw it now. Neither bright nor proud, these men wore colors smeared with mud and may up more sinister things. Only their banners still hung high and clean, whipping in the air as wind battered them about. Some border skirmish, then? said Lauren. I have heard that Dorsey enjoys making war upon seven southern cities and towns, trying to reclaim land they have long considered their own. The people here have grown used to it, they say. Open your eyes, girl, said Brimlad. That is no border raiding party. It is a force of conquest. They mean to take the city, and when they do, they will march north into Selvin. But, but they cannot do that, said Lauren. The High King would never allow it. The High King is countless leagues away, and like as not has heard nothing of this yet. Annis's face was uncharacteristically grim, and Lauren saw steel in the girl's eyes. It made her look very like her mother. The Dorsians will take care that no word of this escapes the city. The High King will hear nothing until the campaign is all but over and the time for response of arms is past. And then what? said Lauren. Then it will be easier to do nothing, said Annis with a sigh. The High King will censure the Dorsians, to be sure, but what more can she do? She would not muster the other kingdoms against them. Some king's minor conquests are hardly worth civil war. Jem looked at her with wide eyes, his lips parted in wonder. How do you know this? I have lived upon the seat all my life, said Annis. Most merchant children learn only numbers and roads, but my mother was Damaris, and she was no mere merchant. I learned these games before most children learn dice. There are always kings hungry for power, and families such as mine must learn to use that hunger for our own ends. My respect for you grows, girl, Jem muttered. And mine, but respect will not gain us the river gate, nor a bite to eat, said Brimlad. If the city is besieged, they will have sealed the gates. What is more, if the Dorsons have half a bit of sense, they will have placed a blockade on the river. We cannot reach Wilmont. What? said Lauren. Then what do you propose? We are close to starving. You think I do not know it, girl? growled Brimlad. I have more belly to lose than all three of you together. We will put up on the shore and see if we can enter the city from the north. Mayhap we can wait within while the kings sort out their differences. No, said Lauren. We cannot stay within the city, not any longer than we must. Are you afraid it will be sacked? Worry not, said Brimlad. The Dorsians will march through the gates, take Wellmont's food and water, and move on. So goes warfare in the Nine Lands, girl. They do not mean only to sack the city, said Lauren. And what makes you so sure of that? Zane's voice startled her. She turned to see him standing at the hatch that led below decks. He leaned heavily upon the jam, and dark bags hung beneath his eyes. He looked worse than Lauren, if that were possible. Brimlad's face turned grim. You are not fit to be walking, Zane. Get back to bed. You have done enough. I am fine, said Zane, and to Lauren's surprise, she believed him. Though his body was weak, there was strength in his voice. His eyes held much pain, but they pierced her like a hawk's. I say again, girl, 
What do you know of Wellmont? Lauren cleared her throat. It is something I saw with Jordell. Who? said Brimlad. Another mystic, said Zane. The girl is simply thick with them. Let her speak. But the captain erupted into a sputtering shout. More mystics! Sky above and sea below! I have had enough of this madness, Zane. All my life I have never found cause to tangle with their kind, and now you have brought me two in a week! Only one, said Zane. Jordell is long behind us. We are fortunate in that, for he is more dangerous than the mentalist I vanquished. But I say again, let Lauren speak. As we rode south in search of you, we saw an army near the road. Sellswords they were, though Jordel seemed to think most hailed from Dolmoon. We found them north of Redbrook, but they marched west, and Jordel thought they made for Wilmot. I see, said Zane. So you fear they may approach even now? Yes, and I believe they mean to catch Wilmot unawares while it fights this foe from the south. I think they mean to raise it. That threw a grim mood upon them, but Brimlad scoffed again. Or they might mean to force the city's surrender. Surrounding a foe does not mean you wish to slaughter them all. Jordale thought, Mystics again, snapped Brimlad. Let them rot, I say. For if we do not make the city, that is just what will happen to us. Lauren scowled and turned to Zane, hoping the wizard would believe her. He stood deep in thought, his eyes boring holes in the deck. All fell quiet as they watched him, until at last he noticed and looked up. Whether they mean to raise the city or not, we would not be wise to remain within, said Zane, for whether their archers mean to kill us or not, still they will fire arrows. A stray shaft is deadly, no matter its intent. We must gain the city or perish, but we will leave it quickly. Agreed, said Lauren. Thank you. You lot may do what you wish once inside, said Brimlad, but the city comes first. At that, they were stuck again. Brimlad steered the boat to the river bank, where they disembarked and traveled a little ways west. Before much walking, they saw the blockade, a small flotilla of four ships that lay at anchor across the river, each lashed to the next and flying the red and yellow banner of Dorsey. "'It is well we did not sail into their jaws,' said Brimlad. He spoke in a murmur, although the ships were a league away yet. "'They would not likely have asked questions before they made pincushions of us.' "'Fortunate indeed,' said Zane, "'though I would call us luckier if we were not starving.' If we go farther west, we shall find Wellmont's northern gate, said Brimlad. There they may let us in. Or shoot us, said Zane. They will be no more trusting than the Dorshan blockade. We could sneak in, said Lauren, under cover of darkness, slipping over the walls. Jem scoffed at her. So says the Nightblade. But have you a grappling hook? Have you even a rope? Mayhap you and I could scale the walls with just our hands and feet, but not the wizard or the girl, certainly not while guards will no doubt be watching. The boy speaks the truth, said Zane. I doubt I could climb a staircase just now, much less a city wall both tall and strong. What if I present myself to the guards, said Annis. They are not likely to shoot a girl on sight, and if I give them my family's name, they may grant us entry. The family of Yaren has never been well-liked in Wellmont, and will be less so now, considering the trade your kin ply within Dorsey, said Brimlad. We are merchants, not warriors, said Annis. A coin carefully spent is twice as deadly as a sword skillfully wielded. Mayhap we could ask him, said Jem. Lauren turned to ask what he meant, and then she saw it. A small creature crouched on all fours down by the bank. Its eyes were huge and bulbous and close to white. Pale and clammy was its skin, and thin webbing stretched between the fingers. It wore a close-fitting jerkin of what looked like snakeskin, but with scales much larger than any serpent Lauren had ever seen. Its breeches were of the same material. Brimlad sucked in a sharp breath between his teeth. A wart! Be off, you little creature! 
The wort scuttled back a bit, but it did not run away. It stopped a pace into the water, its eyes still on them. Quickly it blinked. A thin film of transparent skin slid over the eyes, then vanished again. Lauren stared at the creature in wonder. A word? I have heard of them only in children's tales. They are real and slimy as any water snake, said Brimlad. It has a fish, said Annis. It was true, Lauren could see. In its webbed fingers, the thing clutched a fish the size of Jem's arm. The fish lay still, dead or stunned. Lauren's mouth became a sea of saliva. Hello there, said Jem. He skipped lightly towards the wort, hands outstretched. Never a more beautiful creature have I seen in all my life, O oh, fair wort, or whatever you call yourself. The wort turned and disappeared underwater. Jem skidded to a halt on the riverbank, shoulders slumped in defeat. It is for the best, boy, growled Brimlad. You do not want to trust those creatures. Slimy, untrustworthy thieves, the lot of them. How can you be so cruel to the poor thing? Annis's voice climbed in register as she glared up at Brimlad. It came here to help us. Oh, it did, eh? It told you that? Brimlad folded his arms over his chest. Mayhap I shall trust my own experience, whelp. Worts find boats plying good, honest trade and make off with whatever they can. Nasty little insects, and you would do well. He fell silent as a splash sounded on the surface of the river. Something silver sparkled in the air for a moment, and then the fish flopped upon the ground at Jem's feet. The boy snatched it up like a prize and waved it in the air. A fish! He brought me a fish! Jem crowed. Annis turned back to Brimlad, eyes alight. You had words, I believe, Captain? Brimlad glared at her. Look, said Lauren, he is watching us. She pointed to the river, and the others turned to see. The wort's head poked slightly out of the water, his large eyes peering at them, unblinking. Be off, cried Brimlad, waving his hands. You have left us your fish, though I am sure it is poisoned. Be on your way. Brimlad, barked Zane, leave the thing be. It does us no harm. Not yet muttered Brimlad. Lauren walked slowly down to the river's edge to stand beside Jem. She knelt by the water, holding her hands where the wort could see them clearly. She had enough experience approaching animals in the forest to know how to comport herself. No sudden motions, no loud noises. Hello, she said softly. Can you understand us? The wort's head rose farther from the water. Lauren could see that it kept itself in place by paddling against the current with its webbed fingers. Slowly it nodded, and then its lips parted to reveal a wide row of sharp teeth. Yes, Bubbles speaks well to men. Lauren blinked and looked back at Brimlad. The captain scoffed. Turning back, Lauren kept her eyes on the wort. Bubble, is that your name? It is what humans can call me, said the wort. Well, Bubble, we thank you for the fish. What can we do to repay you? The wort's head turned slightly to the side, an eye trained on her. Bubble does not know this word, repay. Lauren thought for a moment. You have done something for us. Can we do something for you? That is fair. Bubble also does not know this word, but you cannot do anything for Bubble. Bubble does not need anything. He is not hungry. As he spoke, the wort paddled gently through the water to the shore. Once he reached the shallows, he stood, and the sunlight gleamed off the scales of his clothing. Now so close, Lauren could see that the wort stood hands shorter than she was, barely any taller than Jem. Quickly, Bubble's eyes darted to the boy, who still clutched the fish. You are hungry, said Bubble. Why do you not eat? Lauren looked at Jem and thought she understood. 
We are very hungry, Bubble. Do you have more fish? We will trade for them if we have anything you find valuable. Do not bother, growled Brimlad. He probably stole the fish in the first place. The wurt's eyes turned to Brimlad. Bubble did not take from men. Bubble is quick in the water. Watch him. He turned and leaped into the current, vanishing with hardly a splash. Lauren straightened, fearing the wurt had run off but in no time at all he leaped back out. In his hands he clutched a thrashing fish, only slightly smaller than the one Jem held. With a flick of his arm, Bubble slammed its head into a rock on the riverbank. Cautiously, the wirt stepped forwards and placed it in Lauren's outstretched hand. See? Bubble can fish. He does not take them from men. Thank you, Bubble, again. Lauren turned and gave the second fish to Jem, who stared at his prizes as if they were gold. She paused, expecting Bubble to say something else. He merely stared at her, thin film sliding across his eyes every so often in a blink. Soon the silence became awkward. Lauren cleared her throat. Well, Bubble, if we cannot offer you anything in return, mayhap we could ask you a question. Do you know the city that lies just up this river? Bubble nodded. Humans call it Wellmont. We have another name for it, but your tongues cannot say it. Wellmont, yes, said Lauren, nodding. We need to enter the city. Do you know a way in? What would he know, said Brimlad. The city never lets the worts in, not with their reputation. Lauren rounded on him. A captain you may be on your own vessel, but we stand upon it no longer, she snapped. Unless you have a better idea, remain silent and stop insulting the one who just brought us our first food in days. Brimlad's brows drew closer together and his lips turned down, but he said nothing and Lauren turned back, only to find that Bubble had vanished. Far out into the water, she saw his eyes poking out. Come back, she said. I am sorry. I will not grow angry again. Slowly the wirt swam back. When he had emerged from the water, he nodded at her. Bubble knows a way into the city. Their large water door. Bubble can swim beneath it. You cannot without his help, but he will help you. Come. Right now? said Lauren in surprise. Not now. Bubble must make things ready. You will wait, but not here. Here the men in their ships will see you. Bubble will take you somewhere safe. Thank you, Bubble, said Lauren. My name is Lauren, of the family Nelda. Lauren, said Bubble, tasting the word. I like my name better. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R.com. Today's letter is C. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>